First of all, I want to thank y'all for being here. We, um, I came up to DC because these guys are incredibly busy. And so a lot of it is me making sure that I update them on what we're going on, what's going on in the state. And then um, also we just have great communications. They let me know what's going on from the federal side so that we can manage the state better. I let them know what's going on from the state side. So a lot of what we talked about was the cybersecurity situation we've had in the state, what we're doing, how we're managing uh, the constituents with that side of it. We talked about the ports, which continue to be an issue. We wanna make sure that we're strong and continuing to move in a very successful way, and we are. Um, you know, Economic development continues to be key, but infrastructure is a big part of that. So as we talked about that, and then letting them know where we stand on the healthcare exchanges. You know, South Carolina is not gonna take the state exchange. I have also declined the um, Medicaid expansion and so letting them know and them also having that communication back with me on what's going on in D.C. has been incredibly helpful. And so all of those things combined with everything else that's going on from an economic standpoint um, has been an issue. But South Carolina is a state that is on fire in terms of manufacturing, on fire in terms of a good economy. And it's a state that is doing well in spite of D.C. But what helps us do that is by having a great, strong federal delegation that we are proud to say we communicate constantly. Um, there's nothing that I have a question about that they don't help me with. And I think that communication between the federal delegation and the state goes a long way in terms of us being able to have a good business plan for South Carolina and keeping it growing. Can we start with cybersecurity? You mentioned that at the top of your list. What can the delegation of the federal government do to assist uh, what you're dealing with? Well, one, I wanted to just inform them of what we've done for the constituents and how we rapid response, what we did in terms of taking care of that. We're informing everybody that was compromised. Um, we're making sure that all dependents are also covered. Um, we've given free years monitoring, free um, uh, fraud security for life and then a million dollars worth of insurance protection so um, the people of South Carolina are well taken care of in terms of that but they will get letters now telling exactly who was in that um, breach situation so that they can do what they need to to take care of it from this standpoint I let them know that you know IRS still says that being IRS compliant that does not include encrypting social security numbers so it is for me to get out there and tell my governors that it is very important that when you ask your Department of Revenue, are you IRS compliant, as an accountant, that meant security to me. What I didn't know is there are archaic rules where IRS does not ask states to encrypt social security numbers. So I wanted them to know so that as they have their conversations, they can say, you know, some of these, at least notify your governors, notify your states of what compliance is and what it's not. We have asked the IRS and they still won't let us know um, whether they are encrypting federal numbers or what that includes. And that's important for me as a governor. It's also gonna be important for these guys as they're having to deal with that debate of more cyber plans and attacks that we continue to see in the states. Mm -hmm. Senator, is there a lesson learned there? Well, I would say to the to the people back home, one of the things that keep me keeps me up at night uh, beyond the Iranians getting a nuclear weapon is a uh, major cyber attack against our national security infrastructure, our power plants, our chemical plants, our aviation systems, our financial systems. The threat is real. Terrorism, uh, terrorist groups are trying to hit us every day. China, uh, Russia, hostile nations. And uh, the first rule of politics is do no harm. The last thing in the world we need in Washington is give the Department of Homeland Security, who runs airports, the ability to regulate our major businesses and infrastructure, national security infrastructure, from a command and control perspective. So I'm working with Senator Min and others to find a way to harden our national security infrastructure in a business-friendly manner, rewarding businesses who will invest in cybersecurity if you'll get at a certain level uh, on your own and meet best business practices, uh, we'll give you liability protections in case you're attacked, incentivize business. And finally, just uh, from the governor's point of view, I've been here a while uh, and I've never found an office more engaged, more easily accessible than the governor's. When she has a, uh, a business prospect, she calls us all, we get on the phone. And when something's going on at home, uh, she's the first one to call and seek help. And when we need something, you get a good response. Uh, she's a very good advocate for South Carolina business. And uh, I want to applaud her and the legislature for, for not going down the road of uh, state exchanges. And expanding Medicaid on its face looks like a good deal, but it's a disastrous deal for South Carolina. 
and I think we'll revisit Obamacare if we don't. We're making a huge mistake, but I just appreciate the spirit that the governor has about being part of a team. I think we're a good team, and uh, Congressman Clyburn is very much a part of that team. We have a lot of differences, but we try to work together. The governor said something very important, and that South Carolina is going to continue to grow in spite of what happens here in Washington. Obviously, we've got a job to do. In some cases, it's minimizing the damage. But South Carolina is one of those states that's making the right decisions, the hard decisions, to keep taxes low, to improve our infrastructure. We're going to try to do things like expand our energy resources offshore to create revenues to build our, rep, uh, our infrastructure and our schools. But we're going to continue to grow by being a good pro-business, pro-family environment where companies and people from all over the country are going to want to come here. And so the governor has made us very proud in trying to push back against the overreach by the federal government on health care and other issues. And I think that's attracting a lot of growth to our state. So we're going to grow and prosper in spite of the federal government. And uh, I think we're going to be joined by a number of other states who, who follow that same path. And is everybody comfortable with the federal government running the exchange instead of South Carolina? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think what, what the federal government's going to learn, they'll have to pay for it. They'll have to try to set it up. They can't do it very effectively unless they use the private sector. There are private sector uh, uh, companies like eHealth Insurance that could do this type of thing overnight, but all the regs that they have on it won't allow states like South Carolina to use available resources to set it up. So the expense and regulations have just caused uh, states like South Carolina to say, you do it. And I, that's going to give us a little time. It's going to buy us time to continue to push back against this bill, which is, it, it cannot be implemented, and it already has 13,000 pages of uh, regulation, and it's still growing. So by doing this, South Carolina is helping us here bring this back into an open debate, because if they don't change the bill or, or repeal it, it's going to fall just because of the way it's set up. And if I could just reinforce that, if people will follow Governor Haley's lead at the state level, Obamacare will fall of its own weight and will start over and do it right. Mm -hmm. Number one, the Medicaid expansion would include over 30 percent of the people in South Carolina and create a matching component from the state level that would accelerate bankruptcy beyond belief. The state is struggling now to meet the Medicaid match. If Obamacare, if they buy into the Obamacare model, there'll be no money left in South Carolina for education. Exactly. So thank you for not doing that. And if you don't expand Medicare, the whole theory of Obamacare has to be revisited. As far as the exchanges, <clears throat> I want to applaud her, like Jim said, for not buying into a very expensive bad idea. If you haven't noticed, we're broke at the federal level. And if states will do what South Carolina has done, it will require us to revisit this because the cost associated with Obamacare has always been undersold. It's going to be far more costly, and private sector businesses are dropping their employees uh, by the thousands. So I look forward to the chance of doing health care right, which is bipartisan, more private sector uh, centric and less government centric. And let it be said that South Carolina's stand on the exchanges and Medicaid expansion is going to allow us to revisit Obamacare. Well, and as the governor, the decision was actually pretty simple. We asked the state commission to look into it to see whether there were possibilities for exchanges but when you have a bureaucratic plan that dictates what you have to do and how you have to do it and tells you you have to pay for it it's a pretty easy decision for me mm -hmm. if they think they can do it they can have at it they can pay for it the problem is they don't have a plan they don't have a way to pay for it and they were hoping that the states would take this on south carolina is not going to fall into that trap we're just not and so um, the federal government can have at it but what we have found is right now they have no plan and we are perfectly fine with that you may be shocked here that the federal government has no plan but <laughs> <laughs> it's it pretty obvious in a lot of areas <laughs> Yes. Uh, I, I'm up here in Washington, as you know, so I haven't been following the hacking problems in the Department of Revenue. Um, but my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you had expressed some frustration that the, the federal government had not required um, encryption of, uh, either had not required encryption or had not um, uh, encouraged and helped with encryption. Doesn't that stance contradict that your overall stance that the states uh, are better at running their affairs and handling these types of programs than 
the federal government? Well, let's be very clear. I want states to be able to handle this themselves. I want private companies to be able to handle this themselves. But when we ask if we are IRS compliant, we also need to know that we're getting updated information from the IRS on what compliance actually includes. If it does not include social security's number being social security numbers being encrypted, that's something we needed to know. I ultimately am saying that South Carolina is the reason, you know, is at fault for not doing this. I should have asked the extra question. I should have said, does this include encryption? What I'm going to do is go educate all of my governors and say, don't settle for the IRS saying, yes, you're compliant, because what they're not telling you is their rules are, are archaic. They're not saying that, that being compliant doesn't include actually encrypting those numbers, and no governor knows that right now, and so we're working hard to get that out there. Governor, did you discuss the fiscal cliff at all in your meeting this morning? Um, are you leaving that confident that uh, there will be a solution, or are you concerned about the impact it could have on South Well, Carolina? one thing you have to know is this governor is very confident in her federal delegation. I mean, we have a delegation that is on it and continues to work together, continues to think of not just South Carolina, but the country as a whole and a long-term perspective. Um, yes, we did talk about it, and I'll let both of them talk about it. Um, well, as a lot of us shared, um, and Tim Scott was a part of the discussion and uh, other members of the delegation, a lot of the damage has already been done. Uh, businesses don't plan a week in advance. They plan a year in advance. And some of the defense contractors have begun to cut back people. That hurts us in the state because they don't know what's going to happen. Uh, our bases probably will not be affected in a major way on January 1. Uh, they have the flexibility to continue to fund their programs. But if this goes on for months, it will begin to degrade our forces in South Carolina and all around the world. Uh, the challenge we have is the only thing worse than sequestration is to make no cuts at all because federal revenue levels, tax revenue levels, are at historic highs. So the country doesn't have a revenue problem. It, the, go the country needs less government, and those are the hard decisions to make right now. Uh, the big issue for us are the tax rates because that affects businesses and jobs and people at every income level, and it appears that the, um, the president is going to hold the military hostage to getting the tax increases on upper income, which won't solve our problem. It's just a drop in the bucket for the deficit that we have. It's difficult working with a president who has no plan. He won't show us his plan. The House has passed a plan on how to solve the tax issue and the sequestration issue. Um, and we are eager and willing to work with the president. I think every Republican I've talked to has said that. We don't want to go off this cliff. Um, but the fact is, South Carolina is going to continue to grow and prosper regardless of what we do here. And I think we're going to fix the issue that will affect our bases one way or another. You know, if we could do two things, make the tax code modern and more efficient. 35 percent is a gracious plenty to take from any individual. The problem is that most individuals in the upper income levels don't pay 35 percent because it's so complicated, full of loopholes and deductions. What I think we ought to do is actually lower rates, have a 25 percent corporate rate instead of 35 percent, but make corporations pay it. Have very few deductions or have a basket of deductions that would take care of the middle class and pick a rate that's good for job creation, which would be lower, mm -hmm. and actually collect the revenue, which would be good long term for the country. But the reason we're facing becoming Greece is nothing to do with not taxing the rich. It's entitlements. Medicare is $35 trillion underfunded. Social Security is $8 trillion in today's dollars underfunded. Medicare and Medicaid combined in 20 years is going to take all the federal government revenue if we don't fix entitlements. Without entitlement reform, we're going to fail as a nation. I will Try to be reasonable on revenue. I will not raise rates because it will destroy jobs. And what God knows we need jobs. But here's what I want people at home to know. The only way we get out of this as a nation is to reform entitlements. We've made promises we can't afford to keep. It means younger people should give 30 or 40 years of notice of working a couple years longer. And people in my income level, we should be paying more into Medicare, the actual cost of our premiums. And I'll take a little less in Social Security to save the system. If our Democratic friends do not do entitlement reform, then nothing good is going to come from these negotiations. And I don't say that lightly. The one thing I will tell you, I will never raise the debt ceiling again until we address why we got in debt 
and why we're so deep in debt is because of the long-term exposure we have from entitlements being out of control. So if you want Lindsey Graham to raise the debt ceiling, you're going to have help, help Lindsey Graham get us out of debt, and that means entitlement reform. Senator These guys DeBitt, are busy, so last question. Senator DeBitt, um, you, you just said that the government doesn't have a revenue problem. Uh, Senator Graham has been on national TV for the last few days saying uh, he's willing to go against the uh, Grover Norquist pledge. He's willing to accept higher revenues in exchange for entitlement reform. Uh, and he just also said right here that he's willing to pay more at his income level in Medicare, which some people will characterize as a payroll tax increase. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you explain the difference between you and Senator Graham <laughs> over whether there is a revenue problem and whether you uh, are willing to give it all on revenues? Well, again, the country is collecting record levels of tax revenue, and we've doubled spending in the last 10 years. So it doesn't take a lot of deduction to realize we don't have a tax problem, we have a spending problem. Senator Graham has recognized what that problem is. It's, a lot of it's in the entitlement area, although in, even on the discretionary area, I mean, we've, we've doubled spending. So we've got to deal with the spending issue. And, and Senator Graham has also made clear that his goal is to lower rates to improve our economy and to create jobs. And, and we're together on that. And, and none of us have made pledges to any organization here. They're, they're pledges back home when we run for office. And we've told people we're, we're not going to raise their taxes because we believe that the government's taking enough revenue from people already. But as Senator Graham said, a lot of large corporations, a lot of wealthy people don't pay taxes because of loopholes we've got in this amazingly uh, dysfunctional tax code. We can simplify it and we can make it work better. And if we only had 3, 0.3% of 1.3 of 1% growth in our economy, it would produce more revenue over Absolutely. the next 10 years than the tax increases Obama's talking about. And we know that uh, millions of the people that he's taxing are small businesses. A lot of them in South Carolina who, who run their business income through their personal income, but their subchapter S or LLCs. So we know it's going to hurt small business. So our focus, Lindsay and I, are, I think, have a, a very similar focus, simplifying the code, fixing our entitlements for the next generation so that we can control our debt. And we can work reasonably with the president on it. But his, he doesn't have a plan. He said he wants to raise taxes, but that's not a plan. It's not a solution. And if he would show us his plan, then I think we could come together and compromise in a way that makes sense to the American people. But the way he's doing this, it's going to be difficult to come to a compromise because you can't compromise with nothing. And hey, are, are you willing to join Senator Graham? Uh, in, in your I, I said level. last question, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think yeah, just yeah. let him well, just yeah, about, it, 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 at your income level can you slightly higher Medicare premiums? Well, uh, entitlement reform is, is, is going to require a different look. That uh, is a different subject than taxes, and I think we need to look at Medicare and Social Security, give younger workers better options, mm -hmm. and if we give them more choices, I think you'll see that people will pick those choices that cost the government less but give more benefits in the long term. Can I say about Jim and entitlement reform, the very first thing we worked on was trying to find a way to save Social Security from mm -hmm. bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And means testing is one of the approaches with age adjustments. But here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to buy into raising tax rates because that's a political trophy. That's not an economic solution. Mm -hmm. That's a partisan solution. Bowl Simpson didn't raise rates. So when I said that I'm willing to cap deductions to make the tax code simpler and fairer and more productive and lower rates, I think not only does that raise revenue today, anytime you have a more uh, entrepreneurial tax code, you're better off. And God knows the tax code is a special interest dream. All of these deductions and exemptions are because of people coming here and lobbying. Earmarks. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what these things are. They're basically earmarks. So here's where, what Jim and I are saying. We can't get out of debt until you address the debt. And when Dick Durbin says, I applaud Senator Graham for looking at cap and deductions, but I can't do a thing about Social Security. That, to me, is what's wrong with Washington. And uh, I just want to urge the President, if you want a guy like me to raise rates to fulfill your campaign purpose, promises, you don't understand governing, and you sure miss reading the election. You've got to come our way, and we've got to come your way. 
and you've done nothing. I have not seen one plan from this White House that would deal with Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, which are all going to fail and take the country down the road of Greece. And until I hear something from the White House, I'm not going to say another word about revenue. Good. Thank you.